Okay. okay, let's uh, start. Sorry for the delay. So to those who are um, uh, looking at the, at the presentation online, uh, we, we got some issues uh, with the computer, blah, blah, blah. All right. So today, uh, Nivan uh, Roberto Ferral Jr. is going to present his work. Um, and so he's an assistant professor at the Universidad uh, Federal de, de Pernambuco sorry for the pronunciation, in Brazil, in the Computer Science uh, Center. And he earned his uh, PhD from uh, NUI, N NYU uh, Polytechnic School of Engineering, and was working on uh, visual analytics techniques for exploration of uh, sp spatial temporal data. Then I think you did a postdoc in University of Arizona, uh, again in, in the Computer Science uh, Department. And so now, uh, just right now, you're visiting uh, Avis, a uh, team in uh, Lisan. And that's why we have the chance of uh, hearing you today. And um, so Niven's research focuses on uh, information visualization and visual analytics uh, with a wide range of applications. So I scroll a bit here 
um, papers and uh, I saw like uh, you studied burn population at some uh, application in educational field, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and of course uh, urban development that you're gonna I guess talk about today. So thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for being here and being patient. I guess it's, I don't know if there's anybody online, but thanks for being patient if you stay there. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk here today and thank you for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I will talk about a little bit of my research or at least one of the lines of research that I've been pursuing is that of uh, analysis of urban data. Uh, with interactive visualization, right? And uh, to start, uh, I'd like to present or start with a little bit of motivations of this kind of work, which are the cities, which are these environments where most of the human population live nowadays, and most of economical activity and innovation happen. And uh, as the trend shows, uh, the urban population is going to continue to grow uh, in the next decades. Uh, reaching 75% uh, of uh, human, uh, human of mankind in, by 2050. And therefore, there is a need for uh, the cities to adapt, develop, to house all these new populations, of course, to solve the problems that we already have today. And uh, for this reason, uh, the people behind this development, say architects, urban planners, governments, need to be well informed of the type of decisions that they made. And because depend on the quality of these decisions, we might be living in different environments in the future, right? Uh, this is a very important issue. And because of that, many initiatives throughout the world have been started to investigate this issue. Um, and I can mention some in Brazil, here in Europe, and I've seen that uh, one of the lines of research in the Data AI Institute is also uh, related to urban uh, data and mobility, which is very nice. Uh, but we still live in a current, in a scenario where decision makings, decision, uh, decisions in cities are still made uh, on intuition on, in the best cases, uh, limited data analysis. A lot of them happen and I don't think I need to go that far to give you examples uh, uh, about this. Uh, and while many data sets are made available uh, with the open data movement, uh, the reality is that we still lack uh, tools and techniques that would support uh, the analysis of this type of data, right? And the, the research that I'm going to show you today is trying to bridge, uh, bridge this gap of providing these tools for people that actually work on these uh, sectors and with this data to take advantage of this for decision making and, and policy making, right? But before I go into the details of some of the projects that I've been working on, I thought I would give you a little bit of an overview of the research area that I'm in. I think I've seen here many people that work in visualization, but maybe not all. So I can talk to you a little bit more about it. So uh, the definition that I like to use for data visualization is uh, the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations uh, of data to amplify cognition. So uh, the main parts here are the, the use of computer-supported interactive representations of data. So we use the graphical power of modern computers to amplify human cognition, to help people to think, uh, reason, communicate data, right? And uh, the role that visualization plays in data analysis is that often data analysis is not as simple as a straight line like this is a process where you have a bunch of obstacles. It's more like a bumpy road like this, in which you have to make use of a bunch of tools to go through this process, right? And uh, there is all those uh, areas that we need to learn to perform this process, right? So we need to use machine learning, statistics, algorithms, data management and so on. And this process here has an important bottleneck. And the bottleneck is there is a person that is trying to understand 
the data that you gave in the beginning and all the results of all these techniques should try to make decisions. Being it at the end of some process, for example, in the urban domain, may it be when you are maybe developing a model for an automated task and so on, you need somebody to take a look at what is being produced and make decisions on it. Right? And uh, the goal of visualization is actually to focus on this bottleneck to try to make this process kind of a scale for people, right? So that's where we, we sit. Uh, and uh, data visualization is really everywhere. So we've been exposed to visualizations in news, uh, medical domains, uh, more technical domains like uh, genome studies and now urban development. And uh, speaking about urban development, I can give you some examples of how these tools can make an impact. So I thought I would give you uh, a brief summary of something that I did in, in a far past, I guess. Not, I mean, far past for us is it's like almost 10 years, not that far, but it's, it's already in the ancient past. So we did this work of building this system for analyzing the taxi trip data in New York City. And this is in the old, actually old ages, I need to, to say that, of open data where there was no website for, for downloading the data. I actually had to go to the, to the mayors, the, the, the commission that takes care of it with a hard drive to, to get a copy of it. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about it is that when we started to look of how this transportation systems would work in New York City, uh, the taxes actually cover a lot of the what's happening in New York City. Um, and they work actually as moving sensors, if you, if you can think of it, and we can learn a lot about transportation and, and social issues in the city. So we would have something like almost 500K trips a day uh, with 13, thousand cabs running throughout the city every day uh, with many attributes and one of the things that uh, we learned when we talked with the domain experts or people from the taxi and limousine commission of new york is that they didn't or they couldn't explore the entire data as as a whole because they were limited by the tools that they had at the, at the moment and we went up to make a long story short we designed the system and that has some novel components uh, among them this visual query language to to make it easy for people to like navigate through this data right uh, so and and see the results of the query uh, interactively even though the data would be large by uh, the standards at least of that time right and it's still some kind of big data for today um, as a result of that, we actually got to show demo and deploy the system in the, the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And we got a very uh, positive feedback and they actually claimed to us that the, the tool would, was improving the efficiency of the, the people that work in the Taxi and Limousine Commission, the work that they would do in the day-to-day the -day basis, which was also a very good result at the time. Uh, but the, the real reason that I, I quickly show this, this or tell told this story to you is kind of to again summarize what the type of research that I do, and uh, which is to design these interactive data visualization systems that follow a certain process, right? A certain general pipeline where there is an user that has some sort of curiosity or we, what we call formally a task that he, wants to, he or she wants to perform on, on this data. Uh, the user would interact with the system uh, and then this interaction would be translated somehow to uh, a query or a data operation in, in the data backend of the system. This result would be visually mapped uh, in, a, in a device like a screen and then the user would inspect this and then some hopefully learn something from the data and then repeat this process, right? And in each step of this pipeline, there is interesting research that has been happening in visualization, starting from human cognition, because that's what we, we're trying to increase or improve the, the capabilities of the human here. We need to understand how people perceive the, the visualizations that we expose them to. Uh, but 
there is also uh, interesting things that we need to to learn and apply, like how do you actually build the, the, the visual summaries that you need uh, to show people, uh, how do you apply layout algorithms to build these visualizations. Uh, we need to do a bunch with data management and data mining to support this entire process. And of course, the user interfaces to actually make the, 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 the systems usable for people, right? So I've been, in my research, going through this, this pipeline somehow. So I, I touched a, a bit on, on, on these different stages of the process. So what I like to summarize is that uh, my overall goal is to empower people with these better data exploration tools. And uh, what I like to do is, again, to try to achieve this by going through this pipeline and try to make some of the pieces uh, I try to improve some of the pieces or develop techniques for some of the pieces. And as I was said in the introduction, I, I actually uh, motivate a lot of my work in by domain applications. Uh, I've been working mostly on urban data like architecture, architecture and mobility, but I also did some work in ecology, uh, education, and so on. Uh, and from the next last, let's say, five, four or five years, um, what I've mostly been working on these three issues of scalability, uh, interactive visualization, that's actually the kind of main topic that I've been working here with uh, Jean-Daniel Fequette, and then uncertainty visualization and, and data analysis in 3D environments. So these are the main topics that I've been working on lately. And what I thought I would told you, tell you is some of the projects that I've been working on on this, these domains, and hopefully uh, these are going to cover some of these aspects, right? So uh, the first work that I'm going to talk to you about is a project that we did with architects from a, a company called KPF based in New York City, where they reached us and told us that they wanted to use data to plan for these new developments that we're going to build, like these big towers that they would uh, build in New York City. And they came to us with uh, the idea that they wanted to answer mainly two general questions. Uh, the first one is, what defines the character of a given area or neighborhood of a city? What's working there, what's not there, and how, if I understand that, maybe I can define what should be built in a particular location. And once you know that, I would like to see or to simulate a new development. So I, I'm going to build a new tower here. And how would this impact the over the, my neighborhood, the neighborhood of this new development? And uh, we call this uh, data analysis and impact analysis tasks. So just to reference them later. And then uh, we translated this by uh, saying that they wanted to explore different uh, data types or data layers, what, as we called of the city, both 2D and 3D, and also uh, to explore the city in different resolutions because uh, you need to analyze, for example, in the neighborhood level to see if the neighborhood is healthy or not, but you also need to go down to the building level to say, like, if in this particular location, what's actually happening, right? Um, and after this, we uh, also uh, discuss with them this impact analysis. So what they wanted to do is to simulate the replacement of some of the buildings in the city and assess this impact of, of these new constructions. And of course, a new construction could impact in many things. So we had to choose a few measures to, to try to understand. And they actually suggest the, suggested us two of them, sky exposure and visibility that I'm going to talk in a bit in the future. But the main challenge here was to do all of these interactively. So uh, visualization, interactive visualization systems rely on this interactivity so, to, so the, the process of data exploration works well. So there is some uh, background literature that says if, if the latency is high, the quality of the exploration goes down. So we want to achieve these, all of this interactively. And uh, to situate of our work, uh, what we did here was to try to plot what was uh, our position related to the previous works 
on the, the vertical axis, how they support the data analysis tasks. On the horizontal axis, how they support the impact analysis tasks. And many systems like the one that I showed you before of the taxis and maybe some other examples like to, uh, try to analyze a single data set, for example, pollution, as that work by Zeng et al. And it doesn't support any impact analysis. It's supposed to look at the city the way it is right now. Uh, some other uh, works also looked at the city as a living thing where multiple aspects matter. And then we would look at multiple uh, data layers, but again, uh, no impact analysis was possible. Uh, so the architects that we worked with would use uh, some modeling software to try to do the impact analysis, but they would need to do offline because it would take a long time. There are some general tools that you could use like ArcGIS, but again, they are not actually very helpful in the interactivity in the scale that we needed to use. So we designed a system that would lie in this region of, of this plot. And uh, we call this system Urbane that uh, would help you to perform those tasks that I mentioned before to analyze multiple layers of the city at multiple scales and also test this impact what if scenarios of the, 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 the new developments. Uh, we would support many as, as uh, a general a geographical uh, information system. We would support different types of data layers and to, to denote the different entities in the city, going from 2D to 3D for, for the buildings. Uh, for the impact measures, what we would do uh, is actually to, again, go over those two impact measures. The first one is sky exposure. Uh, and we would quantify them uh, by looking at the, each point in, in, a, uh, in the street level, we would see how much of the sky are you exposed to because this relates to how much sun can you get or how much light can you get on the street. And to quantify uh, the impact of it, imagine that I would replace this white building by this dashed one. And then we uh, could quantify the impact by the difference between what you could see the sky before and after this construction, right, represented by this red arrow. And to compute this, what we did is to use the graphics power where we, of the environment that we are in. So we simply put the camera in a certain location, we look up, take a picture. And what we do with this picture is to count how much, oh, this is the picture, how much of the sky can you see in, in each particular picture, right? We would do the same thing related to the other impact measure that would be the visibility. So imagine that you can see a, a certain landmark from, let's say, the, the Eiffel Tower from your apartment, and somebody comes up and builds something in front of it, and it's not nice to you. So you want to quantify that. So and we would do this a similar thing that to quantify the impact for a view to this landmark, right? And the way we did it is that Imagine that you want to see, in, in our example, the One Trade Center Tower. That's this big one. And uh, of course, if you want to measure the visibility for this particular landmark and the impact that one construction has on the other buildings, we would need to measure the visibility from a bunch of buildings, which is not very efficient. So what we did is just to we use the simple fact that if you can see a landmark, the landmark can see you as well. So we would do this, and what we do is that to take pictures from the landmark itself, keep track, keeping track of what can you see and how much can you see from the other buildings. And as a result, we would get a system that looked like this. So you could start your exploration by looking at one particular data layer in the context of the buildings, in this case, the transporta public transportation availability. Uh, this is just to get a feel for, for the initial data, but uh, what the architects would often do is to look at the different neighborhoods of the city in the context of the many uh, data sets that we collected. For example, the number of subway stops, uh, the number of people that work in that particular neighborhood using this parallel coordinate chart. And then once you select some of these criteria here, so the user was marking here and the, the, 
the neighborhoods that would satisfy this criteria would show up, highlighted in, the, in that particular map. And then assume that you chose a particular neighborhood based on, I want to build something where a bunch of people work and where there is a lot of public transportation, for example. What you would do uh, would be to load, and the next level would be the buildings in, in that particular neighborhood, and try to do kind of the same. You would select some criteria like uh, places where there is not much of the, the area usage is low, in the sense that the, the buildings don't use the much of the space, and you don't want, for example, you want schools closed, and you don't want too much crime being happening there, and uh, the building selected would be highlighted there. After that, once you chose the locations where you would change, you would need to develop something, you would simply replace the, the buildings by new ones. These are the colorful ones. So you would change the city, and then after you change the city, you could assess the impact of these new constructions. So uh, what we're going to see is that you, we're going to show you the sky exposure first, and then uh, the state that it is right now, and compute the impact. So you're going to see the regions affected in red and blue for reduced increased sky exposure. You could also mark the landmark there and see which buildings were affected by it, uh, and all of these interactively using the system. Right. Uh, we, we actually, again, deployed this to the to KPF, and uh, it was the first time that they could do all of these interactively. So they were very happy with it, and actually some of them used the, this tool with the, the real clients. Um, the nice thing about working in visualization systems is that once you build this technology, it supports a bunch of future research. So the first uh, one of the results that I'd like to mention here is some other colleagues use this infrastructure to study, for example, shadows in the city, which are very important and regulated somehow uh, by the different cities. So they want to study how the, the buildings would cast shadows uh, on the floor, on the, the ground of the cities throughout the year. So that's a nice, uh, one of the nice follow-ups from, from other colleagues. It was not my work, but they, I thought I would mention it. And uh, of course, I mean, I also worked in some follow-ups from this. And this comes with the next uh, project that I want to talk to you, which comes, which is this one, um, where we kind of complemented what we did in the previous work, is that once you choose a location for a new building, you have to decide which thing you're going to put there. So it's not enough to, be, to choose a location, but you have to choose what is the, the thing that I should put there? And uh, uh, this is very important because uh, what architects would do is that in this early design phase, they would explore different options, right? It's not that uh, somebody asked for one building like of that shape and you, you build it, right? Uh, so we would explore different variations and identify good building designs. Um, and what good means is, again, it's something can be very complicated to say, but there are, of course, constraints that come from the laws of the city and constraints that come from, from what are the preferences or what are the desires of the people that are building them. And between these constraints are views, which we studied before, and is going to be the main uh, thing that we use in this work as well. So, right, so all we care about all of these things also like building efficiency. And uh, the main purpose of this uh, step is to avoid backtracking, uh, backtracking at later stages. So what we would do is that you would explore a bunch of designs at the beginning and then uh, you go into a, uh, like a funnel and then keep throwing out options to get the best one that, get, uh, that remains uh, last, right? Uh, so why, again, we use views? These are things that people notice. If you have a nice view and people are going to visit you, they are going to, to let you know that you have a nice view. Um, it's very limited in views of uh, in dense regions, like big places like New York, or maybe if you go to La Defense here in, 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 in Paris, it's the same. 
uh, and views are related to the values of the properties. So depending where you are, you can have good or, or nice views, or, or bad views, sorry. Uh, and uh, so in order to, to achieve this, we are going to try to build uh, or change a little bit the system uh, that I just present to you to support this choice, right? So what we did is to come up with this workflow that you would specify the design space so that you have to specify what are the options that you're looking at, right? And there are many of them, infinite amount of them if you, if you want. Uh, formally, and then you would evaluate how good they are based on the views. From these, you would identify a set of distinct ones or good ones that you sh the system is going to automatically do this and suggest to the user some of them because there are infinite amount of them. You don't want the user to look at infinite amount of buildings. And then you would also support exploration so you can pick and study these ones to get the ones that you're going to choose later. So for the, the, the design space, what we did is that we worked with ar the architects to define a parametric space for the shapes of the buildings. So there are some options. Uh, basically, a building is uh, a collection of what they call these uh, curves, these stage curves, right? So, uh, and then they are connected to form the different floors. Uh, and you can ask, choose to connect them straight by the corresponding points or basically don't connect them. So it would be these two different options. And then once you do this, there are a set of parameters that you need to choose for each one of these curves. Uh, and uh, you also can perform some operations to move them uh, respectively to the, the center of the, 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 the ground uh, terrain that you are working on. And then you'd have something like this. If you want something more round or less round, if you want to change the number of sides, if you want to rotate or not rotate each particular uh, curve, or if you want to, I mean, how many of these curves do you want to have, and also how you move relative to the, to the previous ones. So you have a parametric description of this, these building shapes. And uh, so, once you define these parameters, you have a space, right? So at least, actually, in these parameters and the number of profiles, then these ones you can think of as a parametric space that you can specify numbers, and each one would correspond to a, to a shape like that. And then for the view evaluation, of course, what a good view is is uh, subjective. So uh, what we did is actually wanted to, to have a way for the user to provide some preference on it. And we work again with the architects to define four different cri uh, criteria. Uh, the first one is an obstructed view, which means how far can you see from a particular location? How, the farther you see is the better. Landscape view means if you can see parks or water bodies. Uh, landmark view is if you can see important landmarks in the city. And building variation is if you can see different architectures throughout your, throughout your view. Some places you might see just the same buildings all over again, but some other places you can see some diversity, and which is judged to be better by the architects. So what we, we would do then is to discretize the surface of the building in what we call windows. And uh, what we would compute as a view score would be a weighted average of the four criteria that you saw before. So it would define, the user is going to define weights, and then we would compute that for each one of these windows and would uh, summarize it in one view score. And then uh, we can compute the building view score, the score for the entire thing. We chose to do it as the average of all the windows. We could do different, but that's the way we did it. And uh, uh, that's how we define how good a building is. But we have a problem there is that we now want to evaluate this for a bunch of buildings, right? Because we, know, we want to explore this space. So the way we did it, so we, again, to do it interactively, was to define what we call this view index. Is it, uh, it's uh, uh, technically, or maybe the way it's implemented, it's a 4D texture array 
that it's built in a pre, uh, pre-processing step. So if you, when you choose the particular location, we would put a volume around this location, like this. Imagine that you're going to build something here. We would put a volume in, ar around it, and we would sample, like in a grid, inside of it, in different locations, also through different directions, and we would pre-compute the different views for that particular locations. And once you want to evaluate a particular view with a direction in a point inside this volume, we just use the nearest neighbor for the for this point, right? And then I'm not sure if this is clear or not, but we just look up uh, in this table. So we discretize the problem. And we do this because, again, otherwise we would need to perform a million computations of, of those, and this would take a lot of time. So we pre-process this. Uh, in the next step, to identify interesting designs, what we do is to use some techniques to explore this high-dimensional high dimensional parameter space. So what we did, we did is that if you can imagine the parameter space for, for the buildings as this plane here, if you only had two of these, like this kind of, I'm trying to show them as a horizontal plane, uh, each point in this particular uh, plane would correspond to a shape and uh, the view score would correspond to this height of this surface here. And uh, what we try to do is then to view this as a high dimensional scalar function uh, technically, and then uh, use computational topology to select the, the ones that we are interested in, which are the local maxima of this function, right? But we don't get all the, the local maxima because there could be too much. So we use actually the ones that is called the, the high persistence uh, maxima that are there. If you don't know what it is, just to give you an intuition, uh, if you think of this particular terrain, we have four, one, two, three, four uh, local maxima here. Uh, but it might be the case that this small one right here is just a small fluctuation. It's close to this big one or bigger one here. It's, and it represents kind of a smaller fluctuation. And then uh, the interesting thing about the algorithms that we use from computational topology is that it allows us to identify those and kind of reduce the amount of things that the user needs to see by filtering it out, right? So just keeping the right relevant, high uh, relevant ones. And then once we did that, we compiled this in the system where the user would configure the space, saying how much blocks and which sort of connection it would do, define the weights for the weighted average of the view score, and then uh, once you do this, uh, you would say compute. The system would take a couple of seconds, and once this thing disappears, you are ready to look at the catalog. So the catalog would show you the the points like the high persistence maximum of that function in order of the scores with some information here. And we would implement, we implemented a, a shopping cart metaphor where you would select the interesting buildings would put in the shopping cart. You could also, uh, if you explore enough this space, if you decide if you explore enough, you can change the space that you are looking at. For example, change the operation of the connection and do the, the computation again. Again, it's going to take a couple of seconds, and the new buildings are there. So you can look at this other portion of the space and, and try to, again, select the few ones that you want to, to explore uh, later. And then uh, you can even also like import some ones, because uh, the architects might have some initial project that they want to compare against the ones that the system suggested, like, like this one. Uh, and you can also use that same tool to filter the buildings based on the different criteria. Some of them are the measures for the individual uh, view quality scores, but also different measures that were relevant by, uh, to the architect, architects, right? And uh, so you can select some of the buildings, refining your analysis, and you could even uh, do a more refined uh, let's say analysis by selecting a particular building 
selecting some of the windows that you want to, to investigate further and uh, see the particular view from that position. So you can select some of the windows and then you can see, for example, based on the scores, what you could see from that particular window. And those windows are, you can see over here, right? So we again deployed the system. The, the architects were actually playing with the system a lot in the paper we present. I use case where they did exactly get one suggestion from, from, from the, the system, would refine them, load them back in the, in the, the tool, compare them against the, the, the one suggested by the system, and come up with this final rendering of the, of the, the building that they were proposed. Uh, and uh, again, it was a very nice experience in working with them with positive feedback. Uh, there were uh, some some things that we wanted to improve, uh, especially on the way these few functions are defined, because it's globally defined to be easy to define uh, on the surface of the building. But you could imagine that you want to customize based on the area that you are uh, uh, you are working on the surface, and also uh, the view index computation is can be kind of expensive. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to explore and kind of started some discussions already is that inspired by some recent work, we can try to use, for example, uh, deep neural nets to, to try to capture this and maybe increase the scale of what we can capture from this, this view, uh, this view uh, evaluation index, right? Uh, well, I don't know how much time I have, but I think uh, I just have a few more things to, to show. So, uh, first, uh, we continue working on, on, on these type of projects. And one of the issues that we are uh, going for right now is that uh, we are actually going, putting our heads as visualization researchers and saying, what is the good way of doing uh, data exploration in a 3D environment? Because Commonly, visualization is doing it 2D. And then many problems that you have in 3D don't happen in these in, in, in 2D environments, like navigation, occlusion, and so on. Or maybe um, are easier and more, we know more techniques to handle in 2D than 3D. So one of the aspects that we, we investigated in this work was the aspect of navigation. Uh, it's very common, especially uh, in some of the, the, the interaction environments or, or technologies that we are also starting to look at as re, uh, virtual reality, that you are immersed in, a, in an environment where you can't see in, from some positions much of what is around you. It actually happened to me here in Paris at some point, because some places I, the buildings look like the same and that they are tall and I don't see much around them, so I don't, I don't know where I am kind of, and if I, can, I could see a bit farther, I could try to locate myself in a particular location, right? And uh, if you were to switch between this local view and bird's eye view all the time to locate yourself, it could be kind of inefficient. So we thought, why don't we explore new ways to, to I mean, navigate and look at things in the city? Since we are in a virtual city, we can do whatever we want. So we started to play around with these deformation ideas where you could see farther away from what your point of view. And uh, if you have this capability, for example, in a work in a VR environment, what you could do is, is say like, I'm, I'm in a city, I want to see what's in the global context of my analysis. I could just hit the button, and turn this deformation mode and see, oh, okay, now I know where I am, right? And uh, once you do that, you could even use this for navigation. Now you can point maybe to one of the important landmarks in the city and say, uh, maybe I want to go there. And then you hit the button and you start to fly around the city like this, right? So, and we started to look into it and also trying to adapt this for, uh, we want to adapt this type of things to uh, data analysis as well, not only navigation. and. Uh, uh, the last thing that I'm going to just briefly mention is that we started doing this 
Uh, in this paper that's going to be presented in a month or so at the DVS conference, we started actually started to study the representation of temporal data on 3D surfaces. Because if you go further than views, for example, if you go to sunlight exposure and stuff like that, this changes over the over the year. For example, you need to have visual representations for that, and we started to looking into what are the alternatives, what is good and what is bad in this. Uh, in this domain, right? To, to, to conclude, I mean, this, this is a very interesting area with a strong need of tools for decision making. Uh, it's a source of interesting collaborations and from those collaborations, I hope, hopefully I illustrated you that interesting problems came also and are still coming from, from, from this domain. And there is a potential of real impact of optimizing what people are are able to do with this in their domain. And as next steps, what uh, we are trying to achieve from some of these projects are, we are actually starting to work uh, in new impact measures for, for development projects. One, one that I'm particularly interested in right now is sound to measure uh, noise pollution in, in cities and how the different constructions impact this, this issue. Um, we are we are also uh, exploring, uh, following up this temporal uh, data representation, multivariate data representation, because if you think of what we did, we summarized four different uh, measures of how good a view is in one, and then we could have a better representation, maybe if we could represent the four uh, at the same time. Uh, and finally, the one that I mentioned to you already is how would we optimize the scalability of the view computation, maybe using these neural nets. Um, and just before I conclude, I would like to thank Université paris Saclay, the Data AI Institute in here, and of course the AVIS team for, for hosting our visit, uh, my visit, uh, and being so kind to, uh, to me and my wife that also joined me in this visit. And with that, I'd like to conclude and happy to take questions if you have any. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. That was very, very interesting. I was wondering because um, you mentioned that this view, uh, the ideal view is very subjective, right? So in the end, uh, all this kind of kind of visualization is, is, is a bit focused on the, on the building itself, just as an heuristic and from the domain users that are, if I understood correctly, policy makers and, and and I was wondering if part of uh, part of what a view is was um, analyzed by talking with the residents, like what the 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 people who actually live and who might have uh, a building say what is a view. Like maybe actually they don't care, or maybe actually if they see just a little bit, it's okay. So I was wondering if there is any consideration uh, on that. I mean. I, I have one here, so you can. Okay. So, uh, a bit in the sense that, I mean, the architects would suggest that because they have experience with the clients, that they are usually are the people that they discuss to, so directly they, they do this. Uh, but of course, it's hard to summarize them in one point. There, there are studies that do this, so actually they go talk to people and say what is good, and this view is good, and this view is not. And I mean, it's a hard thing to say. So there are papers that measure like 30 criteria on this and, and they get very different and indices on that. So, I mean, it could be a learning problem like having pictures. People have done this already in the ground floor. I'm not like saying, but they have some games online that you can say like what, which one is pretty, which one is not, and which one is the best view. But mostly to evaluate roads, but we could do even the same thing. But I, I would think that it could be very diverse. I don't know. We would be talking about that. But yeah, it would, can be something like related to learn, but then it would require data to learn. It, but again, people from the architecture domain try to do this, but using three, 30 different variables. 
it has a lot of variables. And actually, I wanted to ask if, for example, economical is one a variable because in the end, I guess the price of an apartment might change if it has a nice view or not. So we didn't, I mean, that's the motivation of the work, right? So we want to optimize view because of the price of the apartment changes. Uh, what we wanted to do in the, the beginning actually was to try to make some sort of a regression to say like, if I were to build this, how much could I, 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 I value this view, for example. The problem is it's hard to get this data. It's not easy. So we tried a lot, but I mean, to get what is the, the, the price of an apartment that is in this floor that looks in towards this direction is not an easy thing to get. If we had that, it would be nice to, to have something like this to say, like, what the views are more important in different areas of the city. For example. Yeah, again, we, we, we couldn't find that data at this scale that we wanted to work at. I understand getting this kind of data is, is super complicated, but uh, I was just wondering because I guess it's kind of a, it has a lot of dimensions, it's, so it's very hard to count them all. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other? Yeah, hi, so Jean-Daniel Fekiet from uh, INREA. So, uh, I really like your, your presentation. I think the, from the data AI perspective, I just want to point out that what you were showing is interesting in the sense that many of the projects in AI are trying to do an optimization. So they think that they are starting from data, then they have an objective function, and then they are using a lot of complex methods to do it. What you were showing, I think, is interesting in the sense that there are many decisions that you know are not going to be optimal, but somebody has to do it anyway. And so I would say um, the tools that you're showing, I think, is different from many of the AI-related tools or optimization-based tools. As, as you said, you would like, of course, ideally to optimize the, the price or something, but you don't know how to do it. So you, only thing, the only thing you can do is to explore the design space, show m multiple options, and let people decide uh, uh, according to their skill, hopefully, or their so I think that's really a point I want, I want to insist on because uh, here uh, in Saclay, many people are really very much into optimization and think that um, data science is about finding the optimal solution, whereas in many cases, in many real cases, uh, we don't have an optimal optimality function. So we need to re revert to exploration and exploring a design space, which is already quite interesting. So I really like your presentation for that. Uh, thanks. That's just a comment. Mm, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, as you said, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. But I mean, I, I always advocate for the, the, the synergy between visualization and what you can see and explore from the data yourself and what you can use the algorithms for, for suggesting. And of course, uh, most of or in many scenarios, it's it's hard for you to justify. For example, this is the best one because of what, and then you have to what what is the best and what you analyze and what you didn't analyze. I agree. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a question about um, how much the architect should. Um, would uh, interact on the visualization part. So not only on what's important to look at, but also on how they want it to be and like how, how many interaction you have and how many... I mean, we had a bunch of interactions. Uh, in design, the visualization themselves, I mean, the, the, I think the main contribution that they give is to use the color palettes for the, for the uh, buildings and see and sky and so on. So that was suggested by them, but the, the visualization, we, we did it, but we had many interactions. So we would show them, like, this is our current version, that's what we can do, and this, they said, well, what if I could do this and do that, and then they would do it. So in the beginning, we were just measuring one criteria for the view, and then we were trying to make that work, and then they said, okay, there are these other criteria that we could pick just to get into account multiple opinions or multiple criteria that one is not enough, right? Not only... Uh, how far can you see? But there are other things that you have to do. And uh, yeah, so that was our interaction. But it, it took some time. So we would interact with them a lot for, for some time. But so the design is more like from your side and. From me and my colleagues, yeah. So, yeah, 
thanks uh, thanks a lot for the presentation it was very interesting and um, so in the end you mentioned noise uh, another criteria to optimize and maybe some environmental impact or anything else but um, so in view you you averaged four criteria which kind of made sense so it's all related to you and here right now you have one more and maybe one more and you're not going to average I guess but I don't know because it's at least they're measured in different units um, but um, would you try to, I don't know, explore the whole, like a Pareto frontier of kind of this multi-objective optimization? Yeah. How would it? I mean, this is also an interesting problem because as you said, this, the, this process is not scalable on the number of uh, impact measures that we have as of right now. So uh, actually you can think of uh, the way we already did this four into one, okay, it makes sense, but we could also explore the, the four different ones. Uh, I mean, the idea would be to use a Pareto thing, a Pareto surface, and, and get the, the points. But I'm I'm not sure that is a that's a research question that we wanted to, to address. I, I actually had it there. I didn't comment on it, but there are also the socio-economical changes because if you build a, a big building here, you're gonna need more plumbing. Number of works are going to change. The transportation needs are going to change. So all of this is going to to happen there. And how do you communicate this? Problem, but I would suggest that you don't look at all of them at the same time. You don't need to do it. So the way I, I, we are thinking to approach it is to do it separately from the view first, and just to get the idea of how this would, would then maybe put into the context of both of them. But again, it goes into this problem here and how do you represent multivariate data in this in this environment? And then maybe you switch between one and the other. Maybe you can use a, an, an extra uh, view to show uh, another option from that, but this is kind of open yet. Yeah, great, thank so, you. Uh, let's thank the speaker for this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. There is an issue that we and people cannot write. Like I, uh, no, no, it's uh, it's not people can reach me by email or something. Yeah, I think you want to stay for it, yeah. two more months, yes. something like this. Okay, can, uh, yeah. Knock on the door if it goes by, and yeah, I'll be happy. But where are you located, like geographically? In uh, uh what was it? Can you? Building 6060. It's very close to here. Just in front of Central Plateau. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.